It's the heart of winter, and Air Station Sitka is the lifeline for people across southeastern Alaska. The Coast Guard strains to hear a hunter's call for help. Person calling Coast Guard. Request that you speak louder right into the radio over. And the crew races to medevac a woman in labor before she gives birth. You ever delivered a baby before? I have not. Hey, Chief, will be a first for all of us. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here, every day, 350 highly trained men and women risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. Just taken off for a uh, for a local area trainer. Actually, we were just going to fly around and uh, do some pattern work. Uh, shortly after takeoff, we heard from uh, Sector Juno uh, that there was a hunter who was stranded over by Rodman Bay and unable to get to his boat. As we approached Rodman Bay, we tried to contact the hunter on Channel 16. Person calling Coast Guard. We are on Channel 16. Over. Yeah. We could hear a little bit of static, and uh, we could tell that he was trying to contact us, but uh, his radio, radio was just so weak that he couldn't reach the helicopter. Are you guys able to hear him? No, okay. tell to speak up really loud into it. Person calling Coast Guard, we have you very faint over the radio. Request that you speak louder right into the radio. Over. Okay, I'm just right off of your shotgun side. How you hear that? All right, I'm going to come down to the left for descending and then start the beach line uh, in towards Rodman. Roger. A couple fish boats out here. He came up on the radio and said that he had us in sight and uh, spoke to us on the radio and essentially vectored us into his position. I think I got him in sight. Uh, 1230 now by a, behind a log maybe. I think that's him off the nose. And roll out, yeah, that's something moving, that's a person. Okay, inside. Yeah, there he is. Okay. Lots of place to land. Yeah, why don't we do that so we can go talk to him, see how he's doing. When I first saw him down on the beach, he was down by a log, and I just thought, no tent, no nothing. This guy's cold. This guy's wet. I, was, I just felt really, really sorry for him when I saw him down there. I didn't know how long he'd been out there, so. Clear to move, easy down. Easy down. Tail wheels on deck, easy down. Beast are on deck. We're, he's at, he's he's at, at one o'clock. So we landed on the beach and I got out of the helicopter and I made my way over towards him and I could tell right away that he was pretty cold and looking a little miserable. So uh, I could tell he kind of wanted off the island and wanted to get back home. His friends dropped him off on the boat. He stayed overnight, and this morning he was supposed to get picked up by his friends. And due to the tide and everything, they were unable to get him here to the pub. So he's been out here for a long time. He's been asking weather, so he's pretty cold, and I think he's pretty excited to get back home. I don't like calling for help, but I felt this was the time I needed to. Okay, so you're all good at that. Awesome. When uh, Cam started bringing the patient to the aircraft, I uh, just saw Cam uh, holding him by the arm, helping him navigate his way through the rocks. The guy was obviously, to me, he's very cold. He couldn't move too well. I was surprised he was out there by himself. When I brought TJ in the helicopter, my main concern was just rewarming him because he was just really, really cold, and you could just see on his facial expression that he wasn't very comfortable. So we turned on the uh, heater and then gave him some blankets. This guy's a trooper. He stayed overnight out here. It's unreal. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough night. All right, I'm buckled in. 
Uh, let us know when you're ready to take off. So the survivor, TJ, he stayed out there with no shelter or anything, which is pretty crazy because the weather the night before was just absolutely insane with the winds and all the snow coming down. I just checked his vitals just to make sure that, you know, his heart was working properly and that sort of thing. My name is David Chumslin. People like know me, call me TJ. And I am from Sitka, Alaska. To be real honest with you, I don't know what the outcome would have been had they not come pick me up. The tide was out, and there's no way I could have got the boat to the water. I sat on my seat cushion under my space blanket for the night. You know, I like to think I'm tough and a survivor. But for me to call for help, it takes a lot for me to do that. And I called, and they came. And they treated me with respect. And I appreciate that. He says he doesn't have a ride home. Is there any way we can get calling out for him from here? Yeah, we can do that. There might be even somebody be willing to give him a ride on base. Yeah, actually, we have somebody in the back that will do it. Camera dude wants to do it. All right. Awesome. You can always call any of the people. Thanks, camera dude. <laughs> Report ready for approach. That's ready. Ready for approach. Oftentimes when we get called out, it's uh, when the situation's uh, really, really critical. Uh, it's nice that at this point, uh, you know, we've got a tough gentleman out there. Uh, he's able to take care of himself, but he also knows when it's time to, to call for help. We weren't surprised to find him out there hunting. Uh, the people in Southeast Alaska are pretty tough people and uh, aren't really ones to sit around on the couch. TJ was a little embarrassed at first to get rescued. You could tell, as most people are, you know, you don't want to have to rely on somebody else to pull you out of a situation, but we don't judge anybody. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you out, if, you know, when you're in need. Lieutenant Brooks Crawford, off duty today. This is my wife, Caitlin, and uh, we're gonna take our pups for a walk here, and then uh, shortly after that, we're gonna load up the boats and go for a paddle. You wanna switch? Okay. <laughs> the weather was actually really, really nice today, uh, kind of unexpected, and uh, we often say that since it rains here a lot in Sitka, if you don't get out and take advantage of the really nice days, then you don't have any uh, reason to complain on the, on the rainy days. You think right about here? All right. As a pilot at Air Station Zitka, you know, we do a lot of different missions, everything from aids to navigation, medevacs, long range search and rescue. It can be a little stressful at times, so it's pretty important, I think, on days like this to just get out, paddle around. Why don't we try going down there? Mostly when I'm out packing with Brooks, I'm looking for whales and sea lions and all sorts of cool animals and uh, enjoying the mountains. They're snow-capped right now, so it looks really cool. You can see Mount Edgecombe, the volcano, and just enjoy being in Alaska. We were also testing out a potential rescue swimmer airman. And that's somebody that wants to become a rescue swimmer. All the way up, all the way up, all the way up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lock him, lock him, lock him. I just wanted to advise you guys that, that we are going to divert you for SAR. When we heard that there was somebody in trouble, uh, a definite mission and a place to be, we definitely turned it up. And away we go. Push-ups. You've done this before. You can do it again, right? Don't worry. 
about this. Don't worry about us. Just go do it. All right. All right, push-ups. Today we have our monthly PT tests, and uh, every month we have to do a, a certain set of push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, uh, and we do a swim, and then we do some buddy toes. While we're doing our PT test, we were also testing out a potential rescue swimmer airman. And that's somebody that wants to become a rescue swimmer. So she has to do the same PT mins that we did earlier. And she's just kind of getting herself a base level to see where she at and how physically fit she is for her job. 49. Uh, 50, all the way up, all the way up, all the come way up. On, come on, come on, come on, come there. There have been a handful of uh, women to do this job as rescue swimmers. I can count four right now that are out there doing the job. What's unique about this job, there's no special consideration. The job has no gender, has no color, has nothing. It's can you do it or can't you do it? Lock them, lock them, lock them. Got it, got it. There. <laughs> My name is Katrina Hetrick, and I'm a seaman at Air Station Sitka. To me, it's important to become a rescue swimmer because it's been my lifelong goal. This is my first test for physical preparedness to be a rescue swimmer. The purpose of me taking the PT test was to see if I was ready to go to the Airman program. And the first week you're there, you're going to take that same test. If you fail out, you go back into the fleet and then you're on that list again. So they want to make sure I can do it before I leave. And I'll be testing out from now every two weeks until I leave. 59. Come on, Trini, get it. Get it, get it, get it. 60. Yeah. The sit-ups were pretty bad. I made it through the 60, but barely. Struggled way too much for my own good. One more. Don't hang. Just go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't hang. This isn't an in and out thing. This is for you to figure out what you need to do. Right? Don't get, yeah, don't get discouraged. You're doing really, really well. It's really critical for us to stay physically fit because our job basically boils down to 20 minutes in the ocean trying to save as many people as possible. It's hard work, it's tough work, it's fast work, and you need to be physically fit for that. At the end of the workout, Chief was talking to me and he was basically giving me pointers. He was giving me, like, this is what you need to work on. Core is the biggest thing. And just, he was, he wanted to be as motivating as possible. Uh, got funny I wanted to do it right away. After I really had to think it through, I was like, okay, all you can do is get better from this and just take their words and use them. I just want to advise you guys uh, that we are going to divert you for SAR. The uh, plan is for you to divert to Angoon for medevac. How on that over? Uh, that's a good copy on that. And away we go. I haven't had a medevac in a while. We were actually out on a routine patrol. We were down at Cape Decision Lighthouse to go look for a piece of equipment that somebody left there. Uh, and Sector Juno called us and let us know that there was a 70-year-old man in the town of Angoon who had uh, abdominal pains and uh, some body swelling. The dynamic definitely changes when you hear that you have a, a medevac or a search and rescue case. Most of the small villages here in southeast Alaska only have a small clinic, so when someone's life is on the line, the Coast Guard is their only means of transport to higher care. When we heard that there was somebody in trouble, a definite mission and a place to be, uh, yeah, we definitely turned it up. Up here comes the snow. Well, neat. But you thought it was gonna be easy. <laughs> it looks like it's picking it up. Yeah, this sucks. Yep. The weather changes a lot when you're flying around in southeast Alaska. It can be really beautiful weather here, and then uh, you turn around the corner and you could hit uh, a wall of fog or uh, just a really intense snow band. And then beyond that, on the other side, it can be really nice. Hey, John, next time you talk to a uh, district, can you ask them to make sure that Angoon has plowed their ball field? Roger. 
Angoon doesn't have an airfield. It's just a small community. Uh, we actually have to land in a, in, a, in a football field there. It's the only place they have to land. So uh, the Coast Guard is their only means of, of transport to higher care. Again, Angoon is sight off the nose here. All right, I'm gonna fly over once. We'll take a look at it. Uh, make a right turn out, and then we'll set up for a land. Sounds good. Yep, they plowed it. Once we got to Angoon, the weather was really nice. And we were also lucky that they plowed the field before we landed. This looks good there, sir. All right, yeah, coming slow. down. Nice and slow. Very easy down. Five slow. feet off deck. Man on deck. We landed in Angoon. The uh, patient wasn't actually at the uh, ball field at the time, so we had to send our swimmer out. There was a man in Angoon who had abdominal pains and uh, some body swelling. Man on deck. We landed in Angoon. The uh, patient wasn't actually at the uh, ball field at the time, so we had to send our swimmer out with the ambulance to uh, go pick him up at their clinic. There is a, uh, you know, an ambulance truck. It's basically a pickup truck they had converted with a, you know, a shell on the back. They have room for a gurney back there. Uh, I'm picking up a. Uh... It's good to have as much information, you know, on the ground and uh, get a good set of vitals, you know, and it's really helpful if we have a small clinic or something we're taking the patient out of to get that baseline, you know, before we take them away. Fortunately, the patient was stable, had good vitals. He was calm and sedated. It shouldn't be too long before we get to Sitka. It's about a half hour transit, OK? It'll be pretty quick. There was a really large community turnout once we landed. A lot of them actually got out and helped move the guy to our plane. And it was really cool. Like, you can tell they truly take care of each other. Right as we were getting the patient in, the weather got really crappy again. And try to get out of there as fast as possible. Patients in the cabin. All right, you guys ready? Yes, sir. Coast Guard Sector Juno from Coast Guard Rescue 6030. We have uh, departed Angoon and anticipate being on deck in Sitka in approximately 30 minutes. This is Coast Guard Sector Juno. Good copy on all. Sector up. Coast Guard Hilo Angoon VPSO. Uh, I'd like to Send a uh, thank you to you for uh, the medevac. We really appreciate it. Uh, considering the weather conditions, you guys are uh, really great. We really appreciate it again. Thank you, Coast Guard Helicopter 6030. Uh, glad we could help, sir, and thanks a lot for plowing the ball field. We appreciate it. And uh, you take care. You guys fly safe. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, VPSO. Out. It definitely makes us feel good to know that all these small communities here in Southeast Alaska rely on us. Um, you know, we're really Happy to be here. This is uh, an awesome town. We love uh, love Sitka, love Southeast Alaska. How's the patient doing? Resting. Awesome. Resting family. Good. That's a good sight. Crew report ready for approach. Ready for approach, sir. Roger. It was a uh, night when we landed in Sitka, so there was quite a Quite a bit of snow still on the runway, so we were blowing that around, but we shut down and they transferred the, the patient to the uh, ambulance. I'm Johnny Jack. Uh, I'm 70 years old and I'm from Angoon. I was really suffering really bad. I tried everything, you know, to get rid of the pain, but I couldn't. See, my cap kept getting worse. 
But I'm sure they're at about the Coast Guard, though, they? And well, they might have just saved my wife. I'm gonna go with them. It's definitely a good feeling to know that we picked somebody up who couldn't get here otherwise, got him to higher level medical care, and that uh, he's gonna be in good, good shape tonight because of our flight. We received a phone call to pick up a man that's having heart problems. The doc said his window for treatment is uh, six hours or less. We have limited care in the helicopter, so the scariest part for me is if something was to go terribly wrong with the patient. I'm pretty nervous for tomorrow's PT test because so much rides on it. You definitely don't want to cut it that close, OK? We received a phone call in the operations center here at Air Station Sitka to launch a ready helicopter to Huna to pick up a man that's having heart problems. So we're gonna go from here to Huna with the ready helicopter with a corpsman aboard, pick up the patient, and then get him to higher health care. Hey, hey uh, Rob, when you call Juno, tell him to confirm destination of the patient and uh what hospital we're going to if he needs to go to the closest hospital. The doc said his window for treatment is uh, six hours or less. He can't wait for first light to go. Tonight at Air Station in Sitka, we got a call for a medevac out of the village of Huna for a cardiac patient who was the provider on the ground in Huna was worried the patient could be having unstable angina. And we are sending uh, HS to Christina McRoberts who in addition to her corpsman training and her AMS training has been through the Army Flight Medic course and has advanced cardiac life support level of training. Do you have any updates on the patient? What is, you can probably just like surgeon. Oh, I just heard a seven-year-old male with a heart attack and it okay. grabbed the ACLS gear. We have limited care in the helicopter, so the scariest part for me is if something was to go terribly wrong with the patient. Christina, how far of a transit is it from uh, the airport to the clinic there? Probably like a fourth of a mile. That's from one end of town to the other. So for Southeast Alaska, there, there's really three communities that have hospitals, those being Sitka, Juneau, and Ketchikan. So our typical profile is to go to a smaller towns, get a patient that's in trouble, and bring it to that intermediate level of care at one of those three places. Do we know those? Are we just on the ground with an ambulance? You can call the sector and ask them if we can set that up. Puna has a clinic. They cannot handle the heart attack with uh, the care he needs. He needed to get out to a hospital. Sector Juno from SB34. Roger, good copy on all. There will be an ambulance on scene. And be advised, our ETA is 3-5 mics. Yeah, I would anticipate. We know they just had a little snow squall push through, so I bet it's going to be snowy on the runway. Is they have power control lighting there, or is that a no light runway? I think that's a no light runway. As we got closer to the airport, we knew that it still had some snow on the actual runway. And that's always an issue for us because with snow comes the possibility of uh, a whiteout landing and you lose all your visibility. You know you're close to things that uh, could contact the aircraft, so it's something that uh, all helicopter pilots are concerned about. But sector know that we're going to be. Uh... Uh, yeah, somewhere uh, about 30 seconds out landed. OK, roger that. And we'll call them on airborne. Roger. And crew port ready for approach. Roger. I think I see the ambulance in the building over to the left. There we go. And we got a clear way all the way to the ambulance. Once we arrived in uh, in Huna, we got the uh, the helicopter stopped in the middle of the ramp, and the ambulance was standing by uh, at the gate to the to ramp area. Uh, the rescue swimmer and the corpsman left the helicopter and walked over the ambulance to meet with the town EMS personnel. When we got there, the guy was in a lot better shape than I had hoped uh, he could be. He was in no pain, and he had been given the proper medications. How's the general condition of the patient? Good. He's been pain-free for about three hours, so it's better than I could have hoped for. He's good for transport. OK, so we're going to go to uh, blue light back there for you. Is that cool? I am good to go, sir. Roger. Because you can't hear each other on the helicopter, 
So I gave him specific instructions of uh, numbers to tell me about it, any pain if he was having any, to point to where it was, or just thumbs up if he was still doing good. Well, I expect to be in Sitka at uh, 1000 Zulu. Hey, I'm Coast Guard Sector Gino, rescue 6034, be advised, we are airborne from Puna. We got an airborne coming back here to uh, Sitka. The weather was had actually improved. Visibility was great. A little bumpy, though. Uh, I know that Rob and Christina probably uh, got jostled around a little bit in the back taking care of the patient, but uh, they were all pretty happy. Well, Larry, very good. They're getting the gurney ready. They're going to bring it over here, and then we'll transfer it over there. How are you feeling? Yeah. All right. It's a big team effort to get it accomplished. Um, everybody knows their job very well. Everybody's very good at their job, and it just usually goes pretty well. Well, this is Sitka. We'll be taking to the hospital. Got a nice report from the, from the medic there. We're going to get you over there and uh, take a look at you, OK? All right, all right. So this is I had a very short time to build a solid relationship, but you get in there, you introduce yourself, let them know what you're there for, and hope that it all goes well. Doing medevacs in Southeast Alaska is a fairly satisfying mission in that it's, it's very concrete. We go, we get someone, we help them. And knowing that these villages don't necessarily have a lot of resources and these people are in need of, of transport, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty satisfying to get somebody back and get them to the care that they need. I think Alaska in general, you find lots of close-knit people out in the villages who are very willing to help their community member, neighbor, relative in an emergency. It makes it very rewarding to support people like that who are willing to step forward for their community members. Today we're just going to do a little uh, training. As all of us who've been in the back of the helicopter can attest, success in the back in the dark means knowing where your gear is and how to find it. I'm Commander Leslie Wood, the unit flight surgeon at Air Station Sitka, and we're doing IV training in the swimmer shop today. We're going to give you a patient scenario and some equipment to find, and you have to find it quickly. Sort yourself into two groups. I'd love a mix of swimmers and corpsmen in each group, since you're naturally going to be a team that would work together. We'll have uh, Chris Belisle running stations and uh, Christina McRoberts. The training today is for the rescue swimmers and the corpsmen. We try to have two sets of medical hands on medevac missions, and that would generally be a swimmer who's part of the base crew and then augment it with a corpsman. So those folks are training together, getting used to working as pairs. So average person for more team. My general rule of thumb that I assume to start with is two milligrams. I rely on the rescue swimmers a lot. They're very good at what they do. We kind of depend on each other in the helicopter. We feed off of each other, so we kind of work together very well, and it typically works out great. And this is also really nice, because then when you're writing up, you can write down your first few uh, blood pressures and everything, and then you can just say, see, run report. Overall, with the other corpsmen, if there's something that could have been done better or differently, uh, usually we'll bring it up and use it as a learning experience. All right, 42 year old male with asthma, exacerbation, wheezing, and shortness of breath. Go. Let's take Rob with a glucose first and then uh, we'll start an IV on him. Did you want us to take him, Nicole, with the uh, glucometer? Is on your fingers? Yes, ma'am. What we try to do to make this as real as possible is make it a tight configuration, especially when we start turning out the lights. Uh, that's most of our transports are late at night, uh, no lights in the plane. So most of this stuff is usually done by chem lights or little flashlights that have a green bulb in them. Oh, look at that. Oof. Oh, that was like I got you. butter, John. Dude, that was the best IV I've ever felt. My personal philosophy in training for this job, whether it's just working out or swimming or, or starting IVs at night, is you just, you gotta do it. I mean, our job is to remain calm in a world of chaos. If you're confident, you're cool, you're collected, 
you got the job done. Any other thoughts? Anybody figure anything out that might help us all function better? I think Mike discovered how much of a mess yeah, and how things can get lost easily. Well, that was, that was, yeah, you're right. The rescue swimmer and the corpsman bring different skills to the table, so it is especially important to have them training together. We will save more lives using the combined skills of the rescue swimmer and the corpsman. When I hear that woman's water has already broken, so yeah, the clock's counting, so uh, I think everybody was a little intrepidatious that, yeah, there might be a baby in the back of our aircraft. You ever delivered a baby before? I have not. JC will be a first for all of us. a school for the ASTs and any aviation rating, just something to get you ready for the rescue summer school. Hey. Okay. Just work. We'll work on it. Hetrix is training to be a Coast Guard rescue swimmer. She starts the program in another month or so, and this is kind of like a build-up phase for her, uh, something that we're doing for her to help her along. I'm pretty nervous for tomorrow's PT test because so much rides on it, but I feel prepared. I've been working out, and I've been taking all the ASTs advice, so I know I'm ready. I just got to buckle down and do it. Myself and the guys in the shop, we all worked with Katrina. Today, we're doing a final test. If she passes, she'll be able to proceed on to Elizabeth City for the Airman program. And then Rescue Swimmer A School. Ready? Begin. Her test today is going to start with 50 push-ups, go right into 60 sit-ups, then five pull-ups, five chin-ups. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Someone's been doing their homework. Can I get an oorah? Oorah. Nice. Well, the training has paid off so far. With all the help that the ASTs have given me, I've improved tremendously, so there's always more room for improvement. Then off to the track, she's got to run a mile and a half, under 12 minutes. Ready? Yeah. Begin. So the first time she did her PT screen, it kind of caught her off guard. This is a new program to pre-screen the airman, to go to the airman program, and uh, just better ensure that they're, when they get to the Aaron program that they'll be able to uh, perform at their best, you know, and have a better chance of getting it through. Go, go, go! 15 seconds to spare. You definitely don't want to cut it that close, OK? Yeah. It being a male-dominant field, there's always going to be that stress. Um, but at the same time, there's a reason it's open to the females, too. You know, if you can do it, go for it. Then she goes to the pool. She's got some 500 yards under 12 minutes. Begin. Katrina did well. She did well. We're happy to see her going on to that next step, and she'll be going to Elizabeth City to start the Airman program. All right, good job. I passed it and did good in it. Chief has instilled his confidence in me, and he has written to the chiefs over there that, hey, this girl's ready to go. So if I weren't ready to go, it wouldn't look just bad for me, it'd look bad for him. I'd love to come back to Alaska. Once I make swimmer, you got to have that confidence. So one day, I'm sure I'll return. OK. Now, 
Put the Ready Hilo online. Now put the Ready Hilo online. Medevac, Haynes to Juno. Now put the Ready Hilo online. My name is Tiffany. We just got a call from district. A 27 year old female going into labor, water has broken. Um, in Haynes, we're gonna need to pick her up and go to Juno to a hospital that is able to deliver her baby. Haynes is a town about 130 miles north of here. So we quickly got changed out and went down and got the aircraft going. When I hear that the woman's water has already broken, we weren't sure, no one was sure how far along in her pregnancy she was, but when the water breaks, you basically have 12 hours for the kid to come out. So yeah, the amount of time it's gonna take us to start, get airborne, get over there, the clock's counting, so uh, I think everybody was a little intrepidatious that, yeah, there might be a baby in the back of our aircraft. ETA is 2200 local, over. Roger, 2200 local, touch in one five, sector out. You ever delivered a baby before? I have not. Hey, Chief, it'll be a first for all of us. Delivered a couple. Have you? No. No. <laughs> For this case, we are taking a Corman. It just provides a higher level of medical care in the back, more opinions. Um, it just makes it safer for the patient during the transfer to have a medical Corman with us. When I hear a woman in labor, I'm worried about any sort of complications that the pregnancy could be having. Is the child coming out the wrong way? Or is there a problem with the mother? Was there some sort of internal bleeding? And you're also worried about not only the life of the mother, but the well-being of the child. We got a call from district, a 27-year-old female going into labor, water has broken um, in Haines. We're gonna need to pick her up and go to Juno to a hospital that is able to deliver her baby. ETA is 2200 local, over. Roger, 2200 local. When I hear a woman in labor, I'm worried about any sort of complications that the pregnancy could be having. Is the child coming out the wrong way? Or is there a problem with the mother? Was there some sort of internal bleeding? And you're also worried about not only the life of the mother, but the well-being of the child. All right, hold us to a uh, low air taxi down the runway. The only issue with weather tonight is going to be uh, it snowed recently in Haines, and it's just a matter of whether the runway has been plowed or not. So coming in, if it has been plowed, even if it has been plowed, with light, airy snow, as we come in, we kick up a lot of wind, uh, and we can get into a whiteout condition. This thing plowed. Coast Guard 6034, 6034, Coast Guard check to Juno, cross opposite Yeah, this thing is plowed. You can go ahead and secure the guard. Roger. Doors coming open. Doors open. Oh yeah, that's really nice. It would appear that quite possibly the ambulance, yep, it's here. We get to Haynes, we land, uh, we did start to white out a little bit, uh, which made the landing a little bit more difficult. Uh, we taxi in, the ambulance was there waiting for us. Um, our medical personnel got out, uh, went over to the ambulance. Ready to go to the hospital? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, get you out of here. Got the patient loader up and we were off. Are you doing okay? Okay. There was already an IV uh, connected to her, so we just kept that going. And one of the main things is we just wanted to keep her comfortable and warm. We should be on deck in 20 minutes. Are we going to have uh, EMS stand by? Yep. Roger. When I got assigned to Alaska, I didn't think I'd be doing all these medevacs out of the villages. Thought 
bad weather, big waves, thought we'd be doing a lot of stuff out to sea. Uh, here in Southeast, though, the bulk of what we do is medevacs out of these villages, and it is a pretty big responsibility for the air station to be sometimes the only provider to get patients from the villages to a higher level of care that they do need. Ready for approach. Doc, are you going to be going to the hospital? I think I'm going to jump in, yeah. When we got to Juneau, ambulance was waiting, fire department was there to help out. Uh, we shut down the aircraft as quick as we could and handed the patient off to local EMS. I love being a rescue swimmer because you just never know what you're going to get any given day, whether it's going to be delivering a baby in the back of the helicopter or picking somebody up off a boat. So it's a fun job. After we gave the patient off to the EMS, we definitely did talk about it. And we're like, oh man, that was pretty close. Like the lady could have gave birth in the back of the helicopter. My name is Lisa Seely, and I live in Haines. I've lived in Haines most of my life. I ended up delivering George at 7.06 in the morning. Yeah, I couldn't have asked for a healthier baby, a better labor, everything went really, really well. My fiance and I are very, very grateful the Coast Guard came and got me. Alaska is a great place to work. You get to get out into these communities and see folks who give it their all for each other and are willing to step out and help each other in event of emergency. I think getting to interact with those people and come in when it's dark or the weather's bad, you know you're gonna be the only option to get that patient to a higher level of care and potentially save their life is extremely rewarding.